seeking counsel. Amen. And, you know, when you hear that word seeking counsel, normally you're going to some advocate, you're going to some uh, help somewhere, some medical, but we're seeking counsel spiritually and scripturally uh, and talking about the li living the crucified life. And uh, as we are in this endeavor to serve God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and understanding, uh, we need to realize that counsel cannot come from man. It's got to come from God. Yeah. Uh, you, you talk to people and they're going to say, this is what you need to do. And this is good enough or that's good enough or I feel this or I feel that. And it's never about feeling. It's never about what people think. It's what does the word of God say? Because it's the word of God that is going to judge. It's going to, the word of God is going to lift me, encourage me, and help me. It's not going to be uh, somebody's uh, thought process or somebody's mindset. It is going to be the word of God. We're told by Jesus, by his apostles, by the word of God, and by the church that to live for God with any, any sort of success, there's got to be a separation, amen, from the things uh, uh, concerning this world and the draws of this world. Uh, and Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, he said, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Praise the Lord. So we are the temple, and we've got to get this mindset. We are not, and don't take this wrong, we're not common. Amen. We, we, we are not common people anymore. We have been transformed. We have been changed. We have been renewed. And now we're children of God. Amen. Now we are the temple of the living God. And this is what God said. Uh, because you're the temple, you're not like the world anymore. We keep trying to fit into the world and live in the world. Amen. But we're not part of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen. So we can't think like the world. We can't act like the world. We can't live like the world. Why? Because we're temples of the Holy Ghost. And we're men and women who are called by God. And God said, I want to dwell within you. I want to walk in you. I want to live in you. So to do that, you need to separate yourself from the ways and the likeness of the world that I would come to you, that I would accept you. Amen. That I would be your God and that you would be my people. Amen. I'm glad the calling of God is not like the world. I'm glad there's a higher calling. And scripture says there's a high calling placed on our lives. And why is that? It's because God has brought us into another level. Amen. Of life. Praise the Lord. Numerous times in the last few weeks, we, we have heard from the Lord that we are to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Amen. We're, we're, we cannot serve two masters. We, that, that there's a, a call. We're called to walk and talk and live in the spirit. And when we begin to crucify our flesh, and not just our flesh, but the lust thereof, of our flesh, amen, we, we find out that we, we find ourselves empowered, amen, to draw closer to the Lord. And, and, and when we say we can't draw closer, it's because there's something in our life that's holding us like an anchor, holding us back. But when we learn to crucify our lives, we will find ourselves empowered, amen, to, to go straight forward and empowered to, to draw closer to him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Closer to not only him, but his will and his desire closer also to eternal life. Amen. The things of this world begin to drop off and our eyes are upon Jesus and, and our attention no longer is in this world. Our attention is on the eastern skies. Amen. We are drawing close to him. Amen. Amen. To the Colossian church, Paul wrote to, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, he said that if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. So if you are risen with Christ, 
Amen. If you, you went into the watery grave of baptism and you rose up and you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said, if you have been risen with Christ, amen, then, then you need to begin to seek those things which are above. See, the natural man, amen, especially if we come in as adults, come into this truth, amen, the natural man is so used to looking this way. And looking downward and looking at this world and, and doing the things of the world. But, but really, we, we need to start seeking the things that are above. Amen. And, and not on the things of the earth. For, because we are dead and your life is hid in Christ, uh, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall also you appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, Inordinate affection, evil con concupiscent. I can't, how's it say that? Thank you. Covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things say, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So I want to focus tonight on, on verse 5. And, and verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And, and he went on to list some, but, but we've heard of the term mortify. Anybody hear that term mortify? And, and in our language today, in our dictionary, uh, it, it means to be annoyed, it means to be confounded, it means to be disgraced. So uh, we, we would use the term in, in statements that shock us, and, and, and we would say, I am mortified that you would say that. I, I'm shocked, I'm surprised. I, I, I'm shocked that you would say that. I, I am mortified that, that you actually went through with this nonsense. I, I don't know if you've ever used that term, mortified. But th that's what it means today. But, but when we go back to the Bible, this word takes on a deeper meaning and a deeper and more direct uh, effect. Amen. In today's lingo, we would read Paul's writing and it would say, be annoyed, confounded, or disgraced by the actions of your members. That's what he would be saying in our in our language today, because that's what it means. Be annoyed, and, and so you do something wrong, and you become annoyed with yourself. Ever done something that's wrong, and, and you tripped up, and you fell in temptation, mm -hmm. and you become annoyed with yourself? Mm -hmm. That's what the word means in our language today. Amen. And there's a ring of truth in this statement, in this meaning, where, where I, I do something wrong and I, and I maybe smack my head against the wall and say, why did I do that? Or, you know, the palm, what's that, face palm your head or palm your head and say, why did I do that? I, I'm shocked, I'm mortified that, that that happened. And there's a ring of truth in that definition. But what Paul was really saying was, uh, really developed into a more of a strategy in this one word. Instead of meaning to uh, annoy or to confound, the word Paul uses comes from the word nerko, uh, nekru, which is a verb that really means to make dead. It, it means to put to death, to slay. It means to drive the knife in and twist it. It means to, to deprive of power, to destroy the strength of whatever it is. So the difference is, it's not just about being annoyed that we did something wrong. And, and, and again, the ring of truth, when we do things wrong, we get annoyed with ourselves. And there's a ring of truth in that. But Paul wasn't saying to be annoyed with yourself. He was saying to, when something happens in your body, when you do something, you fall into temptation, you trip up, you, you fail, and, and all these things, uh, amen, it, it's simply not enough to be annoyed or disgraced. Uh, we need to slay or kill the action. And we need to bring it to the point of death and do not hold back. We need to take the strength of that sin and take it away. In the days of Noah, and we've all read our Bible, in the days of Noah, God looked on the world and he saw the state of the world. He saw the evil that the world was involved in. And this is how God reacted. In Genesis 6 and 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. Now God being holy, which he is, would have been strongly annoyed with his people. 
Amen. Do you get annoyed with people? Do you get annoyed with people around you, friends, family, even, even close family? Do you get annoyed with them? Do you get annoyed with your spouse? God being holy would have been strongly annoyed even by the action of his creation, much like we experience the way the world is going. We get annoyed with the things of the world, don't we? We see the darkness that is enveloping our country, and we get annoyed with it. We see how sin is prevalent in the world. We get overly annoyed with it. Now, if we get annoyed, amen, how do you think God is feeling about the world right now? And this is how God was feeling back in the book of Genesis. Amen. God was not just annoyed. He was so annoyed that he did something about the situation. He was so annoyed, he took the strength of the power and he destroyed it. Amen. He was so annoyed, amen, at the world that he, he subdued the power. He slayed it. He killed it. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 6, uh, it said, And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, uh, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. So God was so upset. He was so upset at the state of the world that he repented. Now, repentance, and I've said this many times, repentance, and you may remember in our Bible study, repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Yeah. Repenting is when we're sorry enough to kill it. See, in our day and age, when we repent, we're, we just get annoyed at ourselves. I'll never do that again. Instead of taking the problem away from ourselves, we just leave it there and say, oh, I don't like it. God didn't do that. He, when he saw the state of the world in Noah's day, it made him so upset that he actually repented and he got rid of the cause of the sorrow. And you know the story, the flood of the world and, and all that that came upon the world at that time because God had repented. This is what God is calling you and I to do. And this is what we're talking about. He is calling us to repent. Amen. To crucify ourselves. That's what we're doing. We're killing. Everybody say killing. Yeah. We're not committing suicide. That's our flesh. But we're killing the desires and the lust of our flesh. We're going to kill. And this is what he's asking us to do. Not kill ourselves, but kill the desires Kill the thing that's stopping us. Kill the thing that's holding us back from him. Kill and slay the thing that's stopping us from having true victory. Amen. Take care and, and not just put it in a bottle and put it in your back pocket. To, amen. He's saying slay yeah. the things that are stopping you from living and walking in the spirit of God. Amen. He, he's telling us to deaden ourselves to sin, to, to bring our bodies under subjection. That is true repentance. Yeah. That is when we get on our knees and we cry out to God in sorrow and we are so deep in sorrow that I'm going to do something about it. Sad to say, but true. Even if it destroys all that are near and dear around us. I'm going to say that again. Even if it has to destroy things that are dear and near to us. Mm -hmm. See, many times we're afraid of offending our friends. So we hang around with them. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and we know, we know they're ungodly. They, we know because our, our life has been following with them. And, and they drag us down. They hold us down. They, they pressure us. Uh, and, and they stop us from victory. Even if it comes to this. I'm sure Noah and his family even had relatives that, that died in the flood. Mm -hmm. He didn't send them a lifesaver, a life preserver. If they didn't get on that boat, they didn't survive. Mm -hmm. And so even if it's uh, things that are near and dear, and it doesn't have to be people, there's things that are near and dear to our heart. That's right. 
that if we get rid of it, it's going to seemingly hurt us. I'm going to offend my flesh. How, how do you offend your flesh? I don't like doing that. I, 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 I kind of nurture my little secret. Was it last Wednesday or the week before we talked about to, it's not always the sinful things. It, it's the weight things that, that uh, hold us down. It's the anchors. It's the chains uh, I mean, that, that have us bound and are pulling us down to the bottom of the, uh, of the ocean. And we start to drown. And, and the Lord delivers us from those things and we play with them. I mean, we've got to stop playing with those things. Like the song says, and we sing it all the time. We didn't say it tonight, though. It, above all else, I must be saved. Is that a true state of mind with us? Above everything else, I must be saved. Is, is my salvation so important to me that, that I am going to repent of everything that's stopping me? Is my salvation so important to me that I am willing to, to leave all this beside? Or do I just enjoy just a little bit too much and I hang on to it for whatever reason? It might bring good memories. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he was saying here, the sting of death is, is not dying. The sting of death is sin. Amen. And the strength of sin is the law. Now, what does that really mean? What it means is the law of God forbids transgressions and it condemns those who ca cause or fall into transgressions. Sin has its controlling and binding power from the law. What the law says, amen, you cannot sin. And so when we sin, amen, it's not just we're sinning, but we're the, the sting of sin, amen, the, the power of sin is the law because the law says this is why we we don't need to obey the law and and i'm not going to stop at that one phrase you see there's laws but we're not here to obey the law we're here to live above the law see we we can't nobody can live according to the law because the law says one thing and by obeying one law you're going to break another and it doesn't matter who you are you're going to transgress and the law was just there to point out you need a savior. So if we learn, amen, to live above the law, the law says I'm a sinner, but I'm living above the law because I am filled with the Holy Ghost and God has empowered me to live for him. So I no longer have to sin. The things that I do, the things that cause me to trip up, they're, they're not there to trip me up. I'm allowing them there to trip me up. That's right. You see, there's a big difference. The law says it's going to trip you. But God says, I've given you power to overcome. The law says you can't make it. But Jesus says you can make it because I put it in your will. Hey, when I've given you authority. I've given you strength. I've given you power. Not the power of sin. I've given you the power to live for God. Hallelujah. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. People say, well, I don't need the Holy Ghost. I can, you can live all you want. In this world without the Holy Ghost. But you're not going to be successful in living for God. That's right. Amen. That's you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You need to, the refreshing and renewing power of God. Well, God said he'll never leave me. But if I don't listen to him. If it's been 30 years since I spoke in tongues. Or five years since I spoke in tongues. There's something wrong. He'll never leave nor forsake me. But because I'm not speaking in tongues, I buried his spirit so I don't hear it anymore. It has no more guidance for me. I, I ignored it for so long, I don't even know what it sounds like anymore. This is why we speak in tongues. Paul said, I, I, I'm glad I, I talk in tongues more than you all. Because it tells me. 
It refreshes my faith. It renews my mind. Hey, I have the Holy Ghost. I can live for God. Because in this day and age, in the strife that's going on around us and the pressure, I need to know I'm going to make it. Hallelujah. And I need to know I've got the strength. The back of my head says, well, I'm going to be with you always. You break to the end of the world. But I need to hear it at the forefront of my mind. Because if I don't realize it, I'm going to fall. And it's not going to be the fault of the Holy Ghost. It's going to be my fault. That's right. Praise the Lord. That's why it's so important that our, our repentance is not just I'm sorry. Amen. That we need that true repentance when, when we're not just annoyed by our action, but we get so annoyed by our action, we do something about it. You can go to God a hundred times. He's going to forgive you. But why would you want to? Why would you want to? Because you think you're going to get away with it? Because true repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. It's turning. It's changing. And I'm not saying, we, you know, we're all sinners. We all need to repent. We, we need to repent anyway. Our annoyance, in our annoyance, we're bothered, but the situation is not rectified. See, if, if I do X, it bothers me, but it's not fixed. Just because I'm annoyed doesn't fix the matter. If somebody calls me a, a, an idiot all day and they say I'm sorry, that's not fixing it. No, that's right. Fixing it says I won't do it anymore. So our true repentance is we solve the sin issue once and for all. In our annoyance or bother, but it doesn't fix. The opposite occurs. See, what happens is if we don't fix it, we get accustomed to it. That's right. So go back to that guy call me an idiot all day. And, and after a couple days, it's not going to bother me because I'm just, I'm used to it. Well, that's okay if somebody call me an idiot. But if it's sin, and I'm used to living with sin in me, yeah. I don't notice it anymore. And oh, I'm sorry, but it doesn't bother me. It annoys me, but I don't fix it. What does sin do when it gets hold of you? It eats at you. And if you don't fix it and get rid of it, it will spiritually kill you. Paul said, instead of living with it, we, we have to destroy it and try to remove it piece by piece. That doesn't work. Because something about sin, you get rid of a little bit of it and, and, and it just comes back and it gets stronger. And you become accustomed to it and it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. And you become used to it some more, and it's getting stronger. And you don't notice it, but, you know, hey, maybe, maybe it's, it's my, um, what do you call that phrase? My, my thorn in the side. Yeah, my cross there. Oh, yeah. uh, my cross there. I can't get rid of it. I can't stop it. So we, we change our focus. Instead of trying to get rid of it, we excuse it. And we say it's okay to be there because I, I'm doing everything else okay except for and so trying to remove it piece by piece is really just what we call torture. You wouldn't kill an animal. You wouldn't kill a cow to put it in your freezer one part at a time. Here, here, here's your ear, and, and here's, your, here, here's your calf, here's your leg, and here's a steak. I, I, I'm hungry today. I'm going to cut a steak out. You wouldn't do that. That's, that's inhumane. That's torture. But that's what we do with sin. We take a little bit out and we're satisfied instead of getting rid of the whole thing. Jesus. Why would we why would we deal with our members? Let me say my members. My members. It's not your fingers and toes, it's your whole being. Why would you deal with your being in such a manner? Don't you care? 
Letting it suffer. Letting the sin get a tighter hold. Letting the sin regain, regain its power. Being annoyed but playing with it is like... Anybody ever have an infected tooth? Oh, yeah. Oh. And you play with it, and you're cranker in your mouth, and you wave one, and try to get the, everything moving around. And What do you do with an infected tooth? You pull it. Who, who's going to pull it? The yeah. Then you go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. You don't sit there for two and a half weeks and... Hmm. That really bothers me, and your face is out here. It really bothers me, and but, uh, I can put up with it. Because that infection, infection doesn't stay in your tooth. I remember a couple years ago, I, I forget, my wife was away, and Corey was home, and I said, Corey, you got to take me to the hospital because my jaw was out to here, and because of the thing with my leg a few years ago, the infection, my leg went boom. So I've got to get to the doctor. I've got to, I've got to take care of this. I'm, I'm not going to mess around with that. Well, that's what sin is. It's like an infected tooth. It's going to do more damage if you don't take care of it. Does anybody really enjoy going to the dentist? No. No. So Paul didn't say to mess around with your earthly members, but, but he said to mortify things. Amen. To, to the Corinthians, he wrote to flee from, from lust and flee from uh, idolatry and flee from these things. To, he said the same thing to, to Timothy, to flee, to run away. He didn't say saunter away quietly. He didn't say sing, you know, whistle a tune as you stroll down the lane. And, you know, nah, nah, nah. No, he said run. Flee, get rid of it. Go, go as fast as you can away. Don't stick around. Don't mess with it. James chapter 1 verse 12. James said, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Now we want to stop there. Don't, oh, I'm enduring temptation. I'm strong. I'm mighty. I'm, I'm spiritual because I'm being tempted and, and I'm enduring and I'm enduring to the end. I'm a good soldier. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. Okay. So it's great when we overcome temptation, isn't it? Something comes your way and kind of, kind of uh, out of left field and, and, and you're tempted and you overcome it. It's a, it's a really a great feeling. Blessed when we endure them. But the question is, why do they come? Why is there temptation? I mean, there's a process to temptation. When we find out how the process works, we can stop it and we can overcome. So the question is, how do they come? And, and we can nip it in the bud if we know it's coming. And here's the process, and here's the, here's the remedy, the process, and how to conquer and counter temptation. In verse 14, he said, but every man is tempted. Well, that's okay. Every man is tempted. Listen to what it says here. When he is drawn away, amen, of his own lust and enticed. And when the lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. So here's temptation. You're not being tempted because you're spiritual. Understand it. You're, the temptation is not coming because you're spiritual. The temptation is coming because you're being drawn by your own lust. Amen. You're, you're not being tempted because the Holy Ghost is on you and, and, and you are super spiritual. You're being tempted because you're carnal. Well, pastor, that's not very nice. I know. But it's true. See, we want, to, we want to blame everything on spiritual things. We want to say, well, because I'm spiritual, I'm going through temptation. Because of this, I'm going through that. And, and, and all these things. But he said, every man is tempted. It doesn't matter how long we've been in church. It doesn't matter how spiritual we have been. No matter how, it doesn't matter how much potential we have. 
You are going to be tempted when you're drawn away of your own lusts. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. There's no exclusion. There is no immunities. See, we're all, if we're sitting here tonight, we are all capable of being carnal. Come on. We're all capable of being carnal. Amen. And when we get carnal, we become drawn by our own lusts. And that's why the temptations come. When you're drawn of your own lust, temptation comes. When temptation comes, you're enticed. When you're enticed, there's a conception of sin. And when that takes place, there is sin. Amen. And then there is going to be death. Now, in that line of, of, of uh, 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 that, that line of thinking, there's repentance every step. But why not repent at the beginning? When you feel you, that you're carnal. Does anybody know when they're carnal? You, you know within yourself there's something wrong with you. So why not at that point deal with it? See, we, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be transparent on a video here, and I'm going to be transparent in church. When I get carnal, I don't care. I like being carnal once in a while. I nurse it. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to be transparent, I want you to be transparent too. You also do that. Well, I've got a one yep. <laughs> Don't tell me that, that you want to get super, switch over to super spiritual in that moment. You realize, hey, there's something wrong. I better go and get things right. No, somebody comes and rubs you the wrong way. You just want to snap. Because you got a reason to. I'm karma. I've been dying to snap at somebody all day. Look at it. So you're drawn away from your own lust and it leads to, it leads to spiritual death. The, the next scripture, James gives an admonition. He lists this stuff and this is what's going to take place. And then he said, do not err. Do not make mistakes. Do not fall into this trap. Understand what's going on. When you sin, when, you, when you're carnal, you're going to be tempted. And when you're tempted, stop it there. If you're being tempted, it's not the fault of the devil. We want to blame the devil. We'll spend all day talking to somebody who's got a bent ear and, and, and uh, want, they're, they're listening to your every complaint. To, and you're going to talk about how the devil's been chasing you and tempting you and laying things before you. It's not the devil. And the devil's sitting, sitting somewhere saying, ha, 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 I'm getting glory. I'm getting praise. I'm being lifted up. You might be blaming him in your mind. You might be talking to one another and, and blaming the devil. And, and the devil had nothing to do with it, but he's getting the notches in his belt. And he's taking the credit. And you're building his pride. Do not give room to the devil. Don't talk about him like that. Don't accuse him because you don't know if it's him or just you. But you know temptation is not of the devil. The temptation is when you are carnal and you're drawn away, not by the devil's lust. Paul didn't say you're being drawn away from the demonic lust. You're being drawn of your own desires, deep-seated desires within your mind, your heart, your body. Way deep down, somehow it's there. A seed was planted somewhere, and now because you're carnal, it's starting to grow. And you've been spiritual for 20 years, and all of a sudden you get carnal, and all of a sudden it starts to take root. And it starts to grow, and you don't even know where it came from, but it's there. You know what's wrong. You know it's wrong. You're not being drawn away by, by your neighbor's lusts. Oh, my, my, my neighbor's got a nice house, so I'm going to lust after a night. That's not his house. It's your desire for a bigger house. 
or something better than your neighbors or whatever it is. It, it's, it's not your neighbor's fault. Amen. It's your fault. And it's not even the fault of the Holy Ghost. Well, if the Holy Ghost is real, he protect me. It's like I saw this little quip the other day. And, and, a, and a guy was saying, well, uh, you know, the whole, I don't need a mask in this COVID thing. I don't need to quarantine. And, and, and because the Lord's going to keep me. The Lord's going to keep me. And, and then all of a sudden he gets sick. And he said, Lord, why weren't you there? Well, I gave you a mask. Yeah. I told you to wash your hands. Right. And, and I told you to stay away from people. So don't blame God. So it's not the Holy Ghost's fault to, that we fall into temptation. You know, they, they talk about the, the social isolation. We have our little bubbles. We don't have a Holy Ghost bubble if nothing's going to touch us. You see, it, it, the Holy Ghost is not there to put a fence around us so that nothing can touch us. He'll protect us. But when I am drawn of my own lusts, I've turned off the security of the Holy Ghost. I walk away from the umbrella of God's protection. I remember years ago, a, a guy said that his, his uh, car, there was something wrong with his car, and, and uh, he had to, in New Brunswick, you have to have inspection every year in your car. And he said, well, I don't have tags. The Lord will take care of me. I said, no, no, the, the angels are not sitting on your car when you're illegal. That's like rob, robbing, a, uh, stealing somebody's car. The Holy Ghost will protect me. <laughs> it's just not going to work. The fault lies within ourselves. I am tempted because I'm allowing my flesh to follow its fleshly desires. This is what Adam and Eve dealt with way back in the book of Genesis. Hey, the, the, God did not restrict them. God did not to, uh, uh, send, allow de demonic spirits to attack them. Amen. Uh, to bring their doom. This came from within themselves. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the, lust of the eye. lust of the flesh. And the pride of life. That was all within Eve and Adam. That was all within them. That had nothing to do with devil. The devil just came and, and spoke to a serpent to, and that, that beguiled them and said, oh, you're not going to die. Now, let's back up a bit. If they were hearing God and if they were spiritual, it doesn't matter what the devil would say, they wouldn't fall. They would have just said, oh, that's not what the word, that's not what God said. That's right. How would they do that? Because they're spiritual not carnal. See, she wanted something to look good and be good for food and give them wisdom. She wanted it. We want to be like God. We want to be wise. First John chapter 2 John wrote, love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Not even of the devil, it's of the world. And the world passes away, and lust thereof, but he that does the will of God shall abide forever. See, it's not about your will. If you do the will of God, you're going to abide forever. Mm -hmm. Instead of cutting the flesh off, we, we mankind, we, we want to continue to dabble in the things that will entice us and, and cause us to fall, causing a shipwreck in our life. We keep failing, and here's the problem. And may, maybe you know what I'm, I hope you know what I'm talking about, because we're all guilty of this. You keep falling and getting up, and falling and getting up, and falling and getting up. What happens after a period of time? Why should I get up? I might as well stay down. We become discouraged. So why not nip it in the bud before it starts? You see, your carnality, my carnality, does not naturally seek God. Our humanity does not naturally hunger and thirst after righteousness. 
our, our, our carnality and the things we fight within us, uh, it, within our members. They long for the pleasant pleasures and the enjoyment of the world. If only I can go into the world for a week. If only for a day. Nobody's going to know. <laughs> Once again, Paul said, Romans chapter 8, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, they mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal man is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can he. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot, let me say cannot, no. you can't please God. Why are we here? What is, what is our role of being alive? Are we not here to please God? He created everything for his pleasure, and we're his greatest creation, so we should bring his greatest pleasure. But if I'm carnally minded, I don't care how good I can sing, I can't please God. Doesn't matter how how great of a worshiper I am, I cannot please God. It doesn't matter how good I can preach, I can't please God if I'm carnally minded. That's right. It's impossible to please God. First Corinthians chapter six nineteen in closing. But don't you realize your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Mm -hmm. For you are bought with a price. Let me say a price. Right. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Why? Because they're God's. You're no longer your own. You're not the person that you were born how many years ago? with a certain name and a certain uh, title, that's not you anymore. You've been purchased. You've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. So you're no longer your own. So, so therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit. Amen. Why? Because they're already, they're God's enemies. You're just borrowing them. You're just renting them. Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Right. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If we seek him yes. and seek his will and seek his will yes. and seek his will, not my will. My will says I want to go and enjoy myself. My will says I want the pleasures of the world. My will says, I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to give. I don't want to live for God. I want to fit in with the world. That's my will. But Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek his will. Amen. And, and when we seek his will, then we will not be drawn by our own lust. If we seek his will, the, the lust can't draw us anymore. Amen. And so sin cannot conceive and sin cannot bring death because it has no impact. Why? Because we've crucified the sin. We've crucified the members of our body that cause the sin. We've crucified our will. Let's stand tonight. And as always, the choice is ours. God made you a free agent to do what you desire but whatever choice you make you pay the price amen